Welcome, everyone, to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abitronistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security to defend Israel. Thank you, of course, to all of our viewers. Thank you to all of our supporters for tuning into this briefing, for tuning into previous briefings so we can bring you behind the headlines what's happening in Israel. Today, I'm a little bit of a different location than usual. I spent the entire day out in the field here with my good friend, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tal Nir. Tal, thank you so much uh, for joining me on the briefing today and for really uh, providing the overview that you have provided today. I want to try to bring to all of our viewers a little bit of what we experienced today. Um, we spent really most of the day up north. As you know, there are uh, a lot of uh, rockets coming from Hezbollah a lot of action in the north, and we needed to come up here to see a little bit of what is happening, a little bit of what the northern residents are experiencing. And we spent most of the day in Sfat, which is the largest city up in the north. We took a trip into their command center to really get a good view of how the city operates under emergency protocol. But before we talk about the north, I want to talk about a little bit uh, connecting to our briefing from yesterday. Yesterday, we spoke a lot about the operation of the IDF in Judea and Samaria, really in northern Samaria, which is a little bit south of where we are right now. And Lieutenant Colonel Tal has a lot of experience in that area. So, Tal, I wanted to ask you, um, yesterday we spoke about kind of the strategic interests that the Army has in operating in Judea and Samaria. Are you able to elaborate a little bit more on the operational level? On the field, what are what are soldiers doing right now in Tulkarem, in Janin? What type of operations are they doing to keep the rest of us here in Israel safe? First, um, I need to mention that uh, this whole operation is uh, an orchestrated operation and several uh, refugee camps in order to make sure that uh, we find the terrorists. We go to the wasp uh, uh, nest and we find the terrorists there. And we make sure that uh, we take care, we eliminate all the heads of the wasp over there. Um, what are the soldiers doing? They're doing several things. First, um, as uh, uh, you know, as I told before, uh, I'm coming from uh, uh, the engineering, combat engineering uh, division. So what the engineering uh, troops are doing, they make sure that uh, the other troops can go inside uh, peacefully. So uh, uh, we use uh, heavy machinery in order to um, uh, evacuate all the uh, uh, roads uh, from uh, bombs and, uh, uh, and mines and uh, other um, surprising uh, uh, surprises that we have uh, on the road for our troops. Second of all, we eliminate, um, kill, okay? We kill uh, uh, several of the terrorists. Um, we go and we arrest terrorists that we know that uh, uh, we're looking for them for a long time. And the, the other thing that uh, we use intelligence, I mean, we plant intelligence uh, 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 materials uh, so we could use in other ways, in other times, that if we need to use uh, intelligence uh, in these uh, refugee camps. So that's it. All right, thank you for that. And just understanding the threat in that area. You know, on these briefings, we've spoken a lot about Gaza, of course. And as we know, there is a security perimeter. There's a fence around Gaza. And unfortunately, we saw on October 7th, that fence was not as strong as we thought it should be or that it was. Are you able to describe to us a little bit about what is the security fence surrounding Judea and Samaria? So, for example, again, these hotbeds of terrorists, let's say Janine, um, what is preventing a terrorist from Janine from waking up one day and just crossing into, walking into Tel Aviv, walking into Kfar Saba? What is the, how hard is that fence? First of all, nothing is preventing him uh, to try and do that because he's motivated. Okay, we try. We are trying to make sure that he will have no motivation to do it, and we're trying to make it in several ways. One way is operations like what we uh, uh, just spoke about, and and other operations, more surgical operations that uh, we're doing. Um, not that major operations, but we go there, we hunt them 
okay? We take them out, uh, those who are responsible. Uh, what is more difficult to do is if someone wakes up in the morning, okay, and he's saying to himself, today I'm going to kill a Jew, today I'm going to kill an Israeli, because we saw and we know that uh, we're not talking about Jews only, okay, you just saw two days ago, three days ago, we just saw uh, uh, that Muslims are, were, all, were also uh, kidnapped, and Muslims and Christians, and of course, not only Jews, but he could wake up in the morning, and what will prevent him is first we have patrols there, okay, uh, which uh, surrounding the Jewish settlements, okay, but are using uh, the patrols that the, the Israeli uh, IDF troops uh, used uh, also to make sure that all the uh, um, the roads there are um, monitored. That's first, and there's a fence. The fence in the uh, 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 surrounds uh, Judea and Samaria is different. It's not the same as the fence that used to be uh, uh, in Gaza. It's a different fence, okay? It's more monitored and um, uh, we have more troops around it because it's so close to the population, uh, the, the Israeli population. So we have to make sure to maintain it clear. Right, thank you so much. And again, thank you to all our viewers who are tuning in, bearing with us. As you can see, we're in a car right now. We have an amazing view right here, south of Tzfat, uh, near the Kinneret. Um, but it's just so, so windy outside. When we were setting up before the briefing, the audio was just such that we couldn't catch anything. So I wish you could be here and see this beautiful view. Uh, unfortunately, not that many people are here uh, to see this beautiful view because uh, people don't want to come up north Certainly tourists from out of the country don't want to be here. And Tal, one of, I think the hardest thing about today's trip was we went to a very large community center in Sfat. And again, Sfat is the, the largest city, 40,000 some population in the north. And there's supposed to be a large klezmer music festival right now happening in Sfat, which was canceled. And we walked into this beautiful auditorium, completely empty. Um, Tal, you've spent a lot of time in Sfat. What was your feeling uh, traveling there just now about uh, the restaurants and you know the, the amount of people on the streets? The feeling is divided to two. First, um, for me, it's bad all the time that I spent there. I was there as a tourist, like you. I mean, like we were today, uh, as a tourist. And as a tourist, it's, it's, um, it's very sad to me to, to see this city that it was supposed to be full of life today, uh, these days full of life, and now is also, it's almost empty. That's first. Second, I know that the situation that we're dealing with today, I mean, the situation that we are in now is, uh, is uh, for me, it's something that is very, uh, it's not a stable, Thing, a situation. I mean, for me, it's momentarily, and it's something that we're working on a better future. That's what I see. And I found it very striking. You know, we were we were up in spot with a group from abroad, and uh, there's a one major intersection in spot. In the middle of the intersection is this shalom. It says peace. And you look over that intersection, you can see straight into Lebanon. And there was another area where there's a beautiful mural on the wall. It says, Love thy fellow like thyself. And again, you look out and you can see straight into Lebanon. And just that contrast about the Jewish values of Tzfat versus uh, the values of, what is it, 20 kilometers away yes. um, is very striking. So one of the things that we did is we entered into the main command center today of Tzfat to get an understanding of how they operate during uh, times of emergency. And, you know, since the beginning of the war, October 7th until now, there have been 45 uh, red alerts for the city of Tzfat, not the entire north, but specifically for Tzfat, where everyone has to take cover, go into their closest bomb shelter. And there have been 150 rockets uh, shot towards Tzfat. And I think three of them um, had, had tragic results, the rest not. And when discussing in the command center how the city can operate from this controlled environment, um, there was a term that they used. Tell, tell us about that term. And tell us what it's supposed to connote in terms of 
operating a city during a war. Yeah, in Hebrew, it's called the Tiputa Tifkud. It's actually a, a functional sequence that's what they're talking about. And this is a term that we use. We saw it in Spat, but we use it all over the country now, uh, especially after uh, October 7th. We need to have uh, uh, the resilience and also we have to maintain, we have the responsibility to maintain uh, uh, normal life to our citizens, okay? So where we were today, we went to the bunker, okay? Which we are not allowed to say where it was, but they have a bunker. We went down to the bunker and they showed us they can maintain and operate from the bunker the mayor goes down to the bunker and they can operate uh, during the, the sirens and, and uh, missile attacks and they can operate and uh, make sure that the rest of the citizens can maintain their normal lives uh, above us. And like they told us, um, they had, um, um, not before long, uh, they had a situation where there were uh, sirens at six o'clock in the morning and uh, they were taking decisions such as whether they're going to open the school day at eight o'clock or not. And eventually they decided to open the school day, but they could operate from, uh, from uh, that bunker, from that shelter and uh, uh, make sure that everything, all the system is working. Right, and they, they showed us really how they operate. It's very impressive. They have eyes and ears across the whole area from that bunker and they can really control all of the different system uh, operations for the whole city it has its own generator. It's obviously very fortified space underground um, and they can really just continue the city to go and to operate uh, under emergency situations. And when we left that uh, location, they showed us um, these pods, these almost like containers like you'd find in for in a lift on a container ship outfitted with a ton of supplies which i thought was so interesting and they're scattered throughout the city and there's like a combination pad on these uh containers and i guess the residents of the city have the the combination and in a time of an emergency they can just they can uh disseminate supplies so I, they saw i i so they had stacks of, of spare generators, gasoline, um, power strips. They had a whole area where people from the community could come and plug their phones in, in the need of a, um, in, in the emergency need. This is for civilians. So we're not talking about the supply room with guns and grenades. It has everything that the civilians need to live in emergency conditions. And they even have toys, which is amazing if you think about it, that the city has these containers scattered throughout the town. I think this, that there's 10 or so of them and they include toys so that if residents need to take shelter for long periods of time and their kids get antsy, uh, they have toys that they can quickly provide to the community to make sure that they um, are well supplied, well stocked and able to uh, really persevere during this war. Tal, one of the other sites that we visited uh, was an area that had in fact been hit by a rocket the trees were all burned up, and that was a strategic site. Can you share a little bit about uh, some of the strategic in sites? Spot, in spot. Um, it's not a secret, so I can uh, say it out loud. Uh, there's uh, an Air Force base um, around Spat, so Hezbollah's aim is to target this uh, base. Uh, they're trying to, um, uh, that's why they have their iron down there, and also they have a uh, uh, um, different uh, um, missiles um, defenders like uh, Patriot. But uh, uh, unfortunately, um, this, this uh, defense system are not defending 100%, as you probably know. I mean, there's no 100% security, uh, nowhere. 100% security sometimes uh, says that you either don't stay there or you block everything and you cannot block everything because people are still living there and people are still walking there. And um, um, But some of the missiles uh, uh, falling into open spaces and uh, this whole area is uh, covered by, um, uh, it's a, a small forest, okay? 
And um, as we saw today, uh, there were a lot of uh, fire, blast, uh, fire, uh, fires, actually, that uh, caused casualties in, uh, on the wild stock. And uh, nature is uh, actually suffering from that and not just uh, human beings. And uh, that's what we saw today. Okay? And still, we have to maintain to protect these areas uh, since uh, the sensitivity of uh, the areas. Right. And we visited the, the Patriot missile spots. And they said that the Patriots, uh, the residents of Tzfat have said uh, that once every two weeks or so, at least, uh, the Patriots will be shot up uh, as the missile defense in the area that's separate from, from the Iron Dome. And that that area is a target of Hezbollah, and Hezbollah can see that area. So, Tal, can you just explain a little bit about how, how, how do the military assets in the north operate if Hezbollah knows where they are located? Is there any mechanisms they have in place to prevent just being constantly seen as a target by Hezbollah? Yes. First of all, the Iron Dome is mobile, okay? So they try and to locate it every time in different places. So the Hezbollah will have um, more difficult. Okay, they can they cannot uh, uh, deny it from them, but that it we can make it uh, uh, more difficult for them to track the the uh, Iron Dome. That's first. Second of all, uh, we try to uh, work from uh, underground. Okay, to make sure that our facilities are are uh, protected, uh, and the third thing that we actually evacuated uh, some of the uh, places or some of that uh, uh, bases, the the camps that we we didn't have that weren't uh, uh, crucial to stay in that area. We have evacuated it uh, so uh, to make sure that you know we make uh, uh, we can make defend, but uh, we don't uh, make uh, more casualties for ourselves. Right, and you know when you're in Sfat, they have cameras which allow them to see um, straight into Lebanon, and when you're when you're in Sfat and you can with uh, equipment see into Lebanon, then it just you think about it, you realize that in Lebanon they can see straight at us. And in theory, if we stand outside in the right spot and wave, they're watching us. And that's a little scary if you think about it. Um, so uh, how, how does the IDF operate under under that scenario uh, where their, your enemy can see you all of the time? First, there's a policy that you have to um, uh, uh, embrace to yourself as a soldier. I'm talking now about the soldiers, not, not uh, the civilians. The soldiers, uh, first, we're trying to do things not uh, uh, in areas that they cannot see, okay? If it's uh, underground or behind walls or, you know, it's, it's, uh, it sounds like, you know, it's not that sophisticated, uh, but that's the way it is. Our cell phones, uh, we, we try to keep and make sure that our cell phones are not with us. Uh, 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 especially when we need to take uh, uh, crucial decisions because they can hear, okay? Because they're, uh, they're lying on uh, the infrastructure of uh, uh, Iran and uh, and uh, they have uh, technology that um, the Hamas didn't have or doesn't have, okay? So we need to take, to make sure that we have all the uh, 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 to prevent them in order to, to prevent them to, to to get to us and uh, every uh, with several other uh, ways that uh, they couldn't do it up until now right okay well thank you tal for joining us for sharing all of that thank you to all of our viewers for for tuning into this a uh, little bit out of the ordinary briefing and uh, if you come to israel and you want to see what we're seeing on the ground and come on one of these tours with us, we're certainly happy to facilitate that uh, when safety allows. One of the places we went today, uh, they told us this is the number one spot Hezbollah aims for. So we had a, only a short amount of time in that spot before we needed to move on. 
So if you're available and able to come with us so we can really give you an understanding of the surrounding areas, we'll keep you safe. We know where to go, when to go. And I think there were there was only three rockets we heard overhead, but they weren't near spots. So we were uh, uh, we were staying safe the entire time. So I want to thank all of our viewers, all of our supporters for tuning into this briefing. And of course, thank you to Lieutenant Colonel Talmir for joining. Thank you to everyone who has sent in questions. We have a lot more issues to address in our coming briefings. We will be back with you next week, 10 a.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. in Israel on Monday. Till then, stay safe, stay strong. Take care, everyone.